So maybe people want to go around and share your form stories, formative form stories. Well, mine was um, co-opted by the keynote speaker. So, <laughs> and which was very cool because I kind of got the inside perspective on what happened beside, behind the scenes on that. But I was just my favorite, and this isn't a formative form story. It's more like my favorite form story. And it's just when they put out the COVID tests, you know, on USPS website. And it was like, you can go in and in one minute, basically you're done. And then a week or we got them in less than a week later, you get your COVID test delivered to your door. And I was able to get my whole family and friends who are not necessarily very tech savvy to just do that. And my parents, the fact that my parents were able to go and order COVID tests, it was just mind blowing. It's like, this is the way it needs to be. This is the best example I've ever seen. Talk about value and, you know, something important and, you know, being helpful. It was just, it was just such a great example. So that's my form story. Awesome. Anyone else? Um, I can go next. I had a recent form story in the last couple of years. Um, I had needed to renew my passport. And in the month I needed to renew it was a beta program to apply online for the first, I think, 10,000 applicants uh, of the month. And so I tried it. It took eight attempts to fully uh, submit the application because of server errors. Every time I would upload a photo, it would crash and start me over. And yet it was still easier than going in person. Um, so even though it was a, a headache, uh, it was still faster than going somewhere and getting photos taken and all of that. I agree. Anyone else? Oh, Alejandro, it looks like you're talking, but you're muted. I don't think it's really a formative form story, but the one that immediately comes to mind is um, when I was going to school, I went to UC Davis and I was applying for financial aid and um, I was taking summer school classes that I had to go to the financial aid office and fill out like a paper form. I couldn't even do it online. Um, and I specifically remember that uh, I needed the financial aid to buy my books for the classes that I was taking and uh, my classes were starting in two weeks. I went, I filled out the paper form, uh, turned it in. The lady at the desk was like, this looks fine. Uh, a week later, I get an email saying that I need to come back in and fill it out again because one of my E's looked too much like a C and their system had like put my name in wrong and it didn't connect with like my online like FAFSA account or anything like that. Uh, which meant I had to go back in, fill back out the form, which meant I didn't actually get my financial aid disbursement until three weeks into already having classes that I could not pay for books for. Mm. You just reminded me of the year I was getting Danielle Lucy from Wisconsin FAFSA forms in my email. <laughs> so <laughs> that was that was like something I wanted to stop <laughs> for her own privacy reasons. Um, Karen or Devin. <laughs> Um, story for us <laughs> yeah so i guess uh uh one of my four i think the one that actually like sticks out to me now is a formative form experience was when i first tried to do my taxes on my own um and uh i was just so overwhelmed and confused uh and uh eventually i just called the irs and somebody helped me and i was just like wow that's incredible I can just call the government and they can like help me with my my tax forms. So I really appreciated that. Um, I was very, very grateful for, to the person who helped me. So, yeah. yeah that's amazing. <clears throat> yeah, I, I truly cannot believe that every American with has to, or, or person with ties to the US has to fill out their tax forms every year. It is something else. So Karen, did you have a story you wanted to share before we get started? Uh, not particularly, but I think Devin just sharing about his experience filling out 
taxes does also remind me of when I was not much younger than I am now and filling out taxes on my own for the first time and just being in general so frustrated with the system of filing taxes just because it was like everyone had to end up paying like a certain amount of money to get access to like TurboTax or similar resources to be able to fill out your taxes and like those kinds of companies will literally lobby the government to keep things hard to do so that you will pay for their forms to be more accessible for you. But anyways, that's my rant on taxes. <laughs> yes, I think everyone could rant on taxes. I love that. All right, cool. So it rant. looks like we are at uh, the kickoff here. So I just want to introduce myself. Hello, my name is Danielle Lucy. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm director of marketing at Code for America. So excited to be able to bring everyone Form Fest today in our partnership with Code for America and Beck Center. Um, and I'm so excited to be able to introduce you all to Code for America's own session, which is building accessible forms at Code for America. Um, this is a one hour session. Our speakers are going to present. Um, we're going to have time for some Q&A. So we'll be on the lookout for that. Um, and since the recording doesn't capture Q&A, if you all could just um, voice things over so that it gets captured, that would be excellent. Um, Want to get started here? Because I know we have a lot of exciting content today. So let's get started. I want to turn it over to Margaret Thorpe. She's Code for America's Senior Product Manager for our Safety Net Portfolio. Hey, everybody. Margaret, take it away. Yeah, so let me start with the basics, like sharing my screen. So <laughs> let's get the slides up here. and. Um, Hopefully y'all can see those okay. So yeah, so I'm Margaret Thorpe. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm the product manager on Code for America's safety net platform team. And I'm here with our designers, Devin and Karen, and engineers, Alex and Cypress, to share some of our experiences building accessible benefit enrollment apps at Code for America. And so we're going to start off with a short intro, then talk about some of the considerations around designing for accessibility, after that, we'll dive into accessibility testing, uh, then take a look at how we build accessible web applications using our internal form flow builder tool, and then finish up with some Q&A. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, and for folks that don't know us, the Code for America is a nonprofit civic tech organization, and we think about how to bring the tools of technology and service design to improve government systems and accomplish our mission of making government work well for everyone as we believe it should. And in 2022, we launched the Safety Net Innovation Lab to expand our focus on improving how people access, use, and maintain safety net benefits like Medicaid, SNAP, and WIC. And this builds on our almost 10 year track record in partnerships with states like Louisiana, Minnesota, and California, and helps bring our lessons learned to scale. And so we believe in a modern people-centered social safety net that provides economic security and health equity and serves all of us. But to serve all of us, the safety net needs to be accessible. And accessibility as we're talking about it here is the practice of making web and mobile apps usable by people of any ability. So including blind, low vision, deaf, limited mobility and sensory sensitive users. Accessibility enables everybody to participate, which is critical for government systems that help citizens apply for benefits. But to really understand how important accessibility is for the safety net, let's take a look at some data. So in this chart on the left, you can see that 13.5% of the US population lives with disabilities. But in the chart on the right, we see that people with disabilities are twice as likely to live in poverty as the general population. About 26% of people with disabilities, that's one out of every four, live below the poverty line. And given this economic inequity, it's not surprising that more than 65% of working age adults with disabilities participate in at least one safety net or income support program. So given how safety net systems are so heavily relied upon by the disabled population, it is super important that they be accessible. And how accessible is the US safety net? You might be wondering. Well, we wondered the same thing. And so Code for America conducted a national assessment to evaluate the landscape of public benefits enrollment across the US. We looked at online enrollment systems for Magi Medicaid, for SNAP, for TANF, for CCAP, and WIC across the entire US 
with a focus on usability, accessibility, and human-centered experiences. And we published this assessment as the Benefits Enrollment Field Guide, which you can explore on our website. We've included a link here. And to assess the accessibility of these systems, we use the page speed score, which is just an estimate of how well the web application might serve clients with disabilities. And you can see here, if you look at the legend down here in the lower left-hand corner, the color coding we have here is where the darkest blue is a score of 90 or higher, this is considered good. The medium blue is a score between 50 and 89, which needs improvement. And the light blue is a score of 49 or lower, which is considered poor. And although a number of states have achieved high accessibility scores in this analysis, for example, Colorado, Michigan, Nevada, and several others, you know, there are also a number of, of states with low scores. And from this assessment, we really concluded that there's a wide variation in accessibility practices across states with many opportunities for improvement. And at Code for America, we're committed to improving accessibility across the safety net through our work. And over the years, we've built many mobile first web applications to help eligible citizens apply for benefits from our state and federal partners. Get CalFresh, for example, is a digital assister that supports the submission of online SNAP applications in California. MN Benefits is an integrated benefit system that lets Minnesota residents apply for nine different benefit programs using one application. And there have been many other examples. And in order to help Code for America engineers quickly build these types of web applications, rather than having to reinvent the wheel each time and build a new application from scratch, we created a tool that we call the Formflow Builder. And the Formflow Builder library is an internal platform tool that we use at Code for America to help our engineers quickly stand up these Java Spring-based web applications that collect form data from users. So it's basically a library. It provides reusable templates pre-built with accessible components to speed up the development of form pages. It provides integrated design patterns like document upload and address validation to speed up development of these benefit enrollment applications. And it provides out of the box integration with things like email and text message notifications to make it easy and quick to deliver fully functioning apps. And accessibility is baked into the Formflow Builder development process. So we consider it at every step along the way. Um, we focus on accessibility as we're doing user experience research to make sure that we understand the needs of all users. And Karen is gonna share with you some examples of this in a bit. We focus on accessibility during UX design, following user-centered design principles and using accessible design patterns and components. And Devin's gonna tell you more about this in a moment. We focus on accessibility during development so building accessible components and making it easy for other engineers that use the Formflow Builder library to reuse those components so that they automatically get accessibility in the apps that they build. And Cypress is gonna show you how we do that. And finally, we focus on accessibility during testing. We wanna make sure that we uncover accessibility issues before shipping as it's much easier and less expensive to fix them then. And Alex is gonna talk about how we do that. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Devin, our designer, to talk about how we design for accessibility. Over to you, Devin. Great, thank you, Margaret. Um, so my name is Devin, uh, and my pronouns are he, him, his, and I am a staff user experience designer here at Code for America. Um, and I think this topic is really important for me because um, you know, before I was at Code for America, I worked for the uh, uh, New York City government. Um, and I, um, we always experience creating accessible, accessible services. Um, but however, I contracted COVID uh, very early during the pandemic uh, and experienced reduced cognitive function while trying to help New Yorkers navigate rapidly changing information and resources. And so this is why I think this particular topic is really important to me. Um, great. So designing for accessibility at Code for America starts with our values as an organization. And those are listening first, including those who've been excluded and acting with intention. 
And our values are paired with our beliefs. We believe that services can be simple, accessible, and easy to use. Outcomes can be measurably better, better can cost less, and we can serve everybody with respect and dignity. And so these values distill down to our core design principles, and we strive to provide affordances and be accommodating to create welcoming experiences for everyone. We take into consideration environmental factors that include accommodating ac applicants regardless of a client's vision display uh, quality or light environment. Physical considerations that include making sure our service is forgiving to those with motor or visual disabilities. Cognitive factors, using our services should accommodate people under high stress, time pressure, or with cognitive disabilities. Um, and we wanna make sure that our services are ready for comprehension and transcreating. Our sh service should always be written in plain, simple language. <laughs> and so the challenge that we really face as designers is how do we understand the ex accessible experience of users, map our principles to the success criteria, and ensure that we are achieving success and beyond. And this is one of the most uh, frequently recurring challenges we face. Um, and we're doing addressing this in multiple ways. Uh, the first being modeling good applications. The second being trying it yourself. The third being replicating that success. And the fourth, empowering everybody to succeed as well. So the first uh, way that we design for success, encouraging folks to try it yourself, uh, making sure that we have some insight as to how screen readers will experience our designs uh, whether that be through mental model research or just sitting down with the best screen reader we have, which is the one that we use, and trying things out. We recently demonstrated the keyboard experience of our applications in person and shared this particular keyboard testing tear sheet for everybody to keep for themselves as a reference for the future. The second way that we design for success is modeling good applications. Much of our practice starts with content priority guides, writing out applications as if they were conversations. We are also building our practice of using accessible annotations in plain language to illustrate how our interactions should be experienced. The third way we design for success is to replicate success. We want to replicate our successes through the use of design systems, whether they be component libraries, content guides, reusable code, or common checklists. And on the note of design systems, a more recent development we are working on is the formal adoption of the US web design system, which uh, will enable us to create equitable digital experiences in line with more broadly accepted standards in the civic tech landscape. And we know how the US WDS can be used to create inclusive forms. And I hope that everybody had the opportunity to attend uh, uh, Ann and Austin's uh, technology um, from the GSA, uh, their presentation on the US web design system before this. So I'm really looking forward to the other benefits of using this design system for our teams, um, the components and guidance on how to use them effectively, and the upcoming uh, critical accessibility checklists, which should be released soon. Additionally, participating in the USWDS community is really exciting because we can expand our impact by helping make the system better for everybody. I had a great experience recently when I discovered an issue in a component during one of my accessibility testing or audits. And the USWDS team was very supportive in trying to understand the underlying issue and <laughs> resolve the bug. So we feel that our principles as an organization are in the right place to adopt the US web design system. So most of our work is going into disseminating the guidance for everybody in our organization, adding <clears throat> the code to our flagship platform, that Margaret mentioned, the Formflow Builder. We are adapting the US web design system to reflect the design of our products and create reusable components in the time leaf templating language, which is the language of the form flow builder, which Cypress will touch on a little bit more later. So the fourth way that we designed for success is empowering everybody with the references and the right resources and training. And whether they be guidance from the government or private sector, there's so many great resources to provide everybody with the baseline mileage baseline knowledge that they need to succeed. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel per se, but we do need to help folks find the wheel makers. This helps us come together and make the work more effective. And so because this is FormFest 
And in the spirit of empowering everyone, I wanted to share some design tips. Uh, recently, I asked our broader experience team what they felt were the top 10 considerations for form design. And this certainly doesn't cover everything, but all of these tips ladder into achieving WCAG 2.1 AA success criteria. So number one, make sure people can fill out the form on their phones, whether upright or rotated and in different lighting conditions. Number two, people should be able to use their keyboard to move around and fill out the form. This means they can only use the tab key, shift and tab keys, the space bar, the enter key, and the arrow keys. Number three, if your form is complicated, break it into sections and pages. Each page should have around one to five questions, and people should be able to skip questions that don't apply to them. Number four, arrange the questions in a way that feels like a normal conversation. People shouldn't have to repeat themselves or remember things from other pages. Number five, each question in the form should have a visible, meaningful, and easy to understand label and interactive form element, such as a text input. Each label should be close to its form element and associated with each other through coded attributes. Number six, for tricky questions, provide helpful information before the form element. This could be instructions about formatting an answer or answering the question accurately. Number seven, Consider whether you need optional questions in your form and clearly show which questions are required. Number eight, when someone makes a mistake or misses a required question, use assertive but forgiving val uh, validation. The message should be near the question they need to fix. Number nine, if there are many questions or choices for a particular question like check boxes, group them with a clear label and ensure that they use the field set HTML element. Number 10, design the appearance of your form questions to look familiar. Use big and simple sans serif fonts and have good contrast. Use dark or black text on a light or white background with a dark border. And number 11, I know I said 10, but you know I think that this one is really important, so I had to include it. Make sure that the form can be read in the language that your users prefer. And I'm gonna pass it on to Karen now to talk a little bit about this. Thanks for in the intro, Devin. Um, let me share my screen real quick to make sure it is doing the right thing. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so just to give a little bit of an intro to myself, uh, my name is Karen, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a user experience designer currently working on safety net benefits work in Louisiana within Code for America. And just to kind of illustrate a bit more some of the things that Devin just walked through um, of the best practices, I'm going to share an example of our process to practice inclusive accessible design at Code for America. So this is specifically the language picker button for the Louisiana Benefits document upload website, which allows clients to easily translate the website into English, Spanish, or Vietnamese, which are the top three spoken languages in the state of Louisiana. So you can actually see this website live if you go to benefits.dcfs.la.gov. And at face value, Sure, it just looks like a super simple button, but I will definitely break down the process of how we got here. First, we started out by reviewing the language picker button across our other products at Code for America, which includes MN Benefits, which is the integrated benefits application website for the state of Minnesota, and Get Cal Fresh, which is California's SNAP application website. We kind of evaluated the pros and cons of our existing language picker components, particularly for accessibility, of course. So for example, debating between using native versus custom components, how the current interaction works with keyboard navigation, our current color contrast ratios and text sizes. We also took a look at some other language picker examples outside of Code for America products as well, such as, of course, the USWDS component, the LEP.gov, which stands for Limited English Proficiency Language Picker. And you can see that's the example in the middle that has a automated uh, carousel of the languages that they offer, as well as NYC Opportunities Language Picker, um, which has been updated since we took a look at this to look a bit more like the LEP's example. 
Um, so Devin and I especially worked closely on uh, this language picker for the Louisiana website since he's our, um, uh, our design system designer at Code for America and decided on some design decisions. So for example, we debated on including a uh, subtitle text with language labels because while we knew that the text size is smaller than the recommended accessibility requirements, even though it doesn't meet those standards, the rest of the button does. And so for those who are able to read the text size, it can help make the functionality of that particular button a bit more obvious. So after I built the button for the Louisiana product, I made sure to follow, of course, our button component design best practices by including the different states for it, um, like um, how to navigate through the button and its drop-down menu in different focus states with the screen reader or keyboard. And I also made sure to use the um, inclusive language content. So for example, directly translating the language label and writing Espanol instead of Spanish. An additional language accessibility UX design practice that we incorporate in our products at Code for America is including the primary action button in the languages that are offered. So for example, you can see in this homepage, the primary button is upload documents, but we also include it in the two other languages, Spanish and Vietnamese. And so if a client were to click the Subir Documentos button, then they would automatically enter the Spanish application flow. So this kind of just helps further uh, give clients another entryway to access the website in their preferred language. I, of course, wouldn't be a great designer if I couldn't say that research is, of course, super important to all of the design work that we do as well. And it goes hand in hand to make sure that we are validating if things are actually working for the people we're designing for. And in this particular instance of the language picker in the Louisiana products, we were actually able to conduct in-person research, especially with Vietnamese and Spanish speaking clients across a variety of backgrounds. So there were clients who were older or less familiar with technology or had varying literacy levels. And we also partnered with community partners who often help um, these groups with translating the things that they're trying to use. And so through research and testing, for example, this is how we found that with automatic Google translations on web browsers, you know how sometimes you open up a website and you'll get a little pop-up that says translate this page into so-and-so language. It was actually messing with our button content and you can see in the screenshot on the right, um, it was translating the button drop down, and so English was showing up twice. So because we were able to bring this into research and put it in front of clients, we were able to find this bug and flag it with our engineers to fix. And with that, I will hand it off to Alex or Alejandro, which is a colleague of me, mine on the engineering team, to share more about the technical accessibility testing processes at Code for America. Thanks, Karen. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Alex or Alejandro Gonzalez. I am a senior software engineer on the platforms team at Code for America and I use he, him pronouns. And I'm gonna talk about how we test for and ensure the accessibility of our applications at Code for America. Uh, so we use something called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG for short. And these are a set of guidelines and criteria um, that really have a goal of setting an international standard for web content accessibility. Uh, and these meet the needs of individuals, organizations, and governments. The standard was created by the Web Accessibility Initiative, which is an initiative within the World Wide Web Consortium, which is the main international standards organization for the internet. And the standard is organized around four guiding principles for web content. And these are that web content should be perceivable, it should be operable, it should be understandable, and it should be robust. And what do we really mean by that? Uh, well, for perceivable, information and user interface components must be presented in ways that users can perceive. For instance, this could mean providing alternatives uh, for text or alt text for images on a page so that screen readers can vocalize it, allowing users who are blind to understand that content. Uh, for operable, users must be able to operate the user interface and the interface should not require interactions that a user cannot perform. For instance, this could mean ensuring that all functionality is available from, available from a keyboard for users with low mobility who can't use a mouse so that they can fully operate the user interface. 
understandable information and the operation of the user interface must be understandable. And this really means websites and the information contained within them should not be overly complicated and they should operate in ways that are easy to understand um, and in predictable ways. This could mean things like making sure navigation remains consistent across all pages within a website to avoid confusing your users, or it could mean avoiding overly complicated, sophisticated language so that your users can easily understand your content. It could also mean providing easy to understand error messages on form inputs so that users can easily identify any mistakes they have made and the steps needed to correct them. For robust, content must be robust enough that it can be interpreted by a wide variety of user agents, including assistive technologies. And user agents here really means devices or technologies that present the web to the user. This could be a web browser, a phone, or even an assistive technology like a screen reader. The goal is to make sure that our applications are robust enough that they can be accessed through as many means as possible. So each principle contained within the WCAG is broken up into a set of testable criteria known as success criteria. And these are graded at three levels. A being the lowest, double A being the mid-range, and triple A being the highest. Depending on the intended level of compliance, web content should satisfy the relevant criteria for all levels up to the desired level. Uh, you can think of these kind of like the steps on an accessibility ladder. So with level A, the first step, these are things that are absolutely essential for some users to be able to use your website. These include things like having that text alternative that I mentioned earlier for text, or sorry, for uh, images or for providing labels for all form inputs. For level AA, this would be the next step up on that ladder. And these are fixes for the most common barriers for disabled users. Examples of AA criteria include making sure there is enough contrast between your website's text and the background color so that users with visual impairments can easily read the content. Or a really easy one, make sure all of your pages include a header that defines the purpose of that page. Uh, for level AAA, this is the top step, and this would be the gold standard. It's not always possible on all content, but it's what we aim for to be as inclusive as possible. This might include sign language translations for videos in your content or more detailed control of navigation for those with severe mobility issues. Uh, so here's an example success criterion, success criterion 1.3.1, information and relationships. And this is level A, which is again, uh, those things that are absolutely essential for some of your users to be able to use your website. And this particular success criterion states that information structure and relationships conveyed through presentation can be programmatically determined or are available in text. So what does that really mean? Uh, I'm gonna take a look at a web page here. Uh, so you can see um, if you are somebody who is a sighted user, uh, you're able to see the relationships between the elements on this page. I can tell, obviously, there's a page here that says, tell us about yourself. Um, there's some inputs that are asking me for information about myself, such as what is my first name? What is my last name? What is my date of birth? And I can kind of tell by the close clustering of these elements, which uh, elements are related to each other. Um, so obviously, what's your first name? Legally, it appears on your ID, uh, has a text input where I can enter some text. Um, and that's for me to enter my first name, right? Visually, I'm able to quickly tell what are those relationships. But for a user who is blind, they aren't able to quickly tell those same relationships. And we need a way to programmatically tell their assistive technology what is the relationship between those elements. So how do we do that? Well, we can use something um, called ARIA properties. So ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And this is a set of roles, states, and properties created by the Web Accessibility Initiative that describe web content and applications to assistive technologies. Some examples include role navigation to indicate that a section of a website contains navigational elements, ARIA described by to indicate that one element describes another, ARIA labeled by to indicate that one element is labeled by another. And honestly, uh, there are a lot more ARIA properties. Um, I could probably do a whole hour long presentation just on ARIA properties by themselves. Uh, so I'm not gonna go too deeply into that right now, but if you do wanna learn more about ARIA properties, I would recommend checking out the uh, W3C website. Uh, there's a link there. Um, and yeah, so how do we use these? 
to create those programmatic relationships that I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, demo the relationship that I'm talking about. So I'm going to turn on my screen reader. And what I'm expecting to hear from the screen reader is this label, what's your first name, being read to me. Uh, the fact that I'm on an input, that that input is interactive, and that it is a text input that I can enter text into. And then I'd also like to hear it describe that text input with this helpful text here, legally as it appears on your ID. So I'm going to turn on my screen reader, and I'm going to tab to that element. Voice over on Safari. Personal info window. Personal info web content has keyboard focus. You are currently on a banner inside of web content. So you can hear my screen reader there. And I'm going to tab to that element. What's your first name? Edit text with autofill menu main. Legally as it appears on your ID. You are currently on a text field. To enter text in this field, type. To open the autofill menu, press the up or down arrow key, then press the return key to enter it into the form. So you can hear there that the screen reader is describing to me a few things. It's told me the label, what is your first name? It's told me that I'm on a text input and that I can interact with that text field uh, by entering text. It's also describing um, that element saying legally as it appears on your ID. I'm going to do that one more time so that you can hear it. Link. Let What's your first name? Edit text with autofill menu main. Legally as it appears on your ID. You are currently on a text field. To enter text in this field, type. To open the autofill menu, press the up or down arrow key, then press the return key to enter it into the form. Voice over off. So I'm turning off the screen reader. And um, again, you can hear those relationships. Um, it's telling me the label. It's telling me that I'm on a text field. And it's describing that text field with legally as it appears on your ID. So we're using ARIA properties under the hood um, to create those programmatic relationships. And um, I apologize for those of you who are not developers or coders. I am going to show a bit of code here. Um, and for those of you who are not um, familiar, this is HTML. Um, which is basically a markup language that defines kind of like the skeleton of a website. Um, and in this case, uh, you can see that um, here is that input for the text field. It has a name associated with it, first name. And you can see there's a label, which has this for attribute, which is saying that this label is for the element named first name. Similarly, you can see that I have some help text here. That help text has an ID of first name help text. And the input has a property aria described by, saying that that property is described by the element with the ID of first name help text. And in this case, that's creating a relationship saying that this help text should describe this input element. And in that way, we're able to create that programmatic relationship between these elements that I'm talking about. So how do we go about testing manually for accessibility? Well, one of the things that we use is that screen reader test that I just showed you. And I'm going to show you what this looks like when it's broken or not working correctly. So here I have a rather basic page. Um, this is a screen that's asking me, are you currently in school? And there are two simple buttons, uh, a yes and a no button. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my screen reader and show you what it looks like when that programmatic relationship we're talking about is not there. Voice over on Safari. So I'm going to go ahead and tab to the first button. Yes, button main. You are currently on a button. To click this button, press Control, Option, Space. And you can hear there that it's telling me that I'm on a button, that that button has a value of yes, and that I can interact with that button by clicking on it using my keyboard. Um, if you want to hear that again, I'll tab to the no button. No button. You are currently on a button. To click this button, press control, option space. The issue here is that it's not telling me what I'm answering yes or no to. Um, as a blind user, I wouldn't really be able to tell easily what I'm answering the question or what, you know, what question am I answering yes or no to. Um, so we need to create that programmatic relationship in order to fix this issue. Voice over off. So I'll go ahead and do that now. I'm going to go back into that HTML. I'm going to take a look at the button. You can see there the yes button is highlighted. And I'm going to add an ARIA property. In this case, ARIA described by. 
And I'm going to say that it's described by the element with an ID of header, which in this case will be the header for this page. Similarly, I'm going to apply that same aria described by to the no button. So now both of these have that relationship associated with them. And I'm going to test again with my screen reader. Voice over on Safari. Link. Yes, button main. Are you currently in school? You are currently on a button. To click this button, press control, option space. So there you could hear it read that I'm on a button, that the button has a value of yes, but you could hear it describe that button with the question, are you currently in school? I'm going to do the same thing, uh, tabbing to the no button so that you can hear that one more time. No button. Are you currently in school? You are currently on a button. To click this button, press control, option space. And again, you can hear it creating that relationship between these elements. Voice over off. So screen reader testing is one of the important ways that we test for accessibility um, for our forms and applications at Code for America. Um, there are some other tools that we use. Um, one in particular that I'm really fond of is a tool called Assistive Labs. And this is essentially a third party tool that provides virtual machines. You can think of these similar to um, kind of like a, uh, a computer in your browser um, that you can access. And specifically, Assistive Labs provides a number of different assistive technologies, um, such as screen readers um, that you can use with different combinations of browsers. So you can select a screen reader, you can select a browser, and you can go ahead and do screen reader testing with that combination using a virtual machine. And they actually provide this tool for free if you're working on an open source project or for reduced pricing if you're a nonprofit. Um, those would be tools that we use for manual testing, but equally as important is automated testing, um, which can help you find some of the low hanging fruit when it comes to accessibility issues. Uh, one tool that we love to use is this tool by WebAIM called Wave. Um, this is a browser extension. You can use it with Chrome, Firefox, or Edge. And it will basically uh, allow you to scan a web page for particular or um, any accessibility issues that it finds. It will tell you any errors or issues that it finds. Um, and you can even see a detailed view describing the issues or errors that it finds. And uh, nicer still is that it will actually tell you the specific web content accessibility guideline or WCAG criteria that is at issue uh, for the thing that it's telling you about. So if you want to learn more about that particular issue, you can go ahead and look at the WCAG um, that it's referring to. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to my colleague Cypress, who's going to talk about creating accessible web apps with the Formflow Builder. Thanks, Alex. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Cypress. I'm a uh, staff software engineer on the platform team at Code for America, um, and I use they, them pronouns. I'm going to walk you through how we create accessible web applications with our internal tool, the Formflow Builder. So we split our code into two separate categories, uh, a Formflow library and individual applications. Um, things that we want to reuse and that we want to ac accomplish in every application, we put in the Formflow library. Um, the library gets imported into new applications and becomes the default for many decisions in those applications. Um, from there, uh, any individual app can create configuration changes. They can opt out of default behavior or write completely custom code for their application only. If an application writes a feature improvement that we think would benefit other applications, we'll uh, import it into the library make the code more generic, um, and make it available for other new applications to opt into. As an example, a previously shown uh, language selector that Karen described, um, that started out in the um, Louisiana application. Um, and for their use case, they implemented it using English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Um, we thought it was a um, really good pattern and wanted to pull that into the library. 
So when we moved it into the library, uh, we added a configuration so that the number of languages in the menu is dynamic. So in the example I'm showing in the slide, I have a configuration of form flow languages, and I provide a list of, uh, of language encodings. So EN for English, ES for Spanish. And my screenshot is showing three languages, but uh, in the application with this configuration, it would only show two. Um, also in the process of pulling this into the library, we can think more about um, other improvements that we can make. Uh, for example, we've added some progressive enhancements to this component so that if a client is using a browser or a device that has JavaScript disabled, um, it will not show the button and only show uh, a list of links for the provided languages. Um, again, we don't know why someone would uh, uh, disable JavaScript. We just want to try to accommodate in some sort of fashion, even if it's not the, the best experience. Uh, another thing we added was responsive web, web design rules um, so that depending on the screen size of the device, um, it will shift between a list of links and a button menu. Um, so if someone has a larger uh, desktop screen with plenty of room, they can get the full list of links that aren't hidden and if someone is on a mobile device, we can tuck those links under the button so that we can focus on the content on the screen. Um, and we package all of this markup and logic into a time leaf component. So here's the example of code to render that uh, language selector. It is a simple um, replace call into pulling all of this, uh, of, of the code for the component in one line of code. Um, so our system uses a templating language called Timeleaf. Um, with it, we create server-side components, and we can reuse any number of blocks of code that we need. Um, this is a similar concept found in other front-end libraries and technologies, such as React, Vue.js, and Angular. Um, this just happens to be all done on the server uh, so that when we send the code to uh, someone's device, it does not uh, necessarily have to have JavaScript enabled to uh, create the component. So um, here's an example of the code that uh, packages up our text input component. On the left is the full expanded code that is rendered on the device. And on the right uh, is the three or four lines of code uh, that is used to activate it. Um, this makes it much uh, easier for us to apply accessible patterns um, that we know all components need uh, within, within the component call. Um, so for example, we know that all text inputs need some association with a label or ARIA label, so we can um, define those calls within the component. Um, also, we can uh, throw helpful errors to our developers. So um, if a developer doesn't provide a label or a ARIA label, the system will throw an error until that requirement is met. Um, this error also happens while a developer is creating these pages. Um, so ideally, the uh, issue is fixed before it ever reaches production. Um, so this is just uh, showing the example that uh, our code is saying that it has to have a label or an ARIA label uh, before it is rendered. Um, and that uh, the library knows that this relationship has to be there. We just don't know what the label needs to be. We're relying on the developers and designers of the uh, project to um, better fill out the meaningful relationship from the label to the text input. Um, so we have all these components. Uh, another tool we use to speed up writing these components are live templates or snippets. Um, these allow us to autofill many of our components, providing good defaults, and we can share these amongst our teams. Um, with these live templates, we can generate buttons, inputs, or even entire screens in a um, couple of lines of code. Um, so this is a live template that creates a page with a single question, um, which we do often. Uh, this automatically creates ARIA links between the title of the page and the question, so that the input is automatically described by the title of the page. 
and here would be uh, the result of, of that uh, snippet that I showed you previously. Um, as, I, as I said, we do this a lot, so it's really helpful to be able to utilize these snippets and focus purely on the content and uh, the structure of that content instead of having to rewrite code all the time. Um, and here I have a little longer video of creating um, a screen uh, with a form and two inputs, uh, a first name and a last name input. So our live templates assume that you'll be using translation strings so that we support internationalization right, off, right out of the box. And um, the live templates also provide optional properties that you can delete if you don't need. So for example, I deleted help text and placeholder as I didn't need them. And so I can focus on writing the labels and forming the content and not restructuring my inputs every time. And so this is the result of uh, creating those two inputs on a screen. OK. Uh, in summary, uh, or thank you for uh, uh, attending our presentation. Uh, here are some of our key takeaways. Um, there's always room for improvement. Uh, design for WCAG success and beyond. Define and test accessibility beyond digital compliance, such as language inclusion audit for accessibility, and build tools that make the right choice easy. If you'd like to learn more, please visit uh, our website, codeforamerica.org. And we can move on to questions. So why don't we start from the bottom rather than the top here? Um, and, and we're not going to have time to answer all these questions, but um, we've got a question here on, so do you have a process for introducing new patterns components into your library? Design Council, devs just contributing. I think we touched on a couple of different examples of how we do that, but um, Devin, do you want to speak to that a little more? Um, yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, we don't necessarily have a formal process, but um, I think the language selector component that Karen discussed is a really good one. Um, and I think the, the need for that component came from um, basically user research and testing uh, and sort of the needs of that particular project. Um, and so we basically met to discuss how we might um, use other, uh, you know, existing components from other products and introduce that as a formal component into our design system. And so it was mostly just one-on-one -on -one working together. And then um, when it came to formally implement it into the Formflow Builder, um, I myself paired with Cypress to sort of translate the needs uh, of the team into the form flow builder um, and so that other teams could take advantage of it. Thank you. Um, this is kind of related, um, This the question just before this one, which is how do you keep your design system, um, wireframing tools, Figma, and form flow library in sync? I don't know, Devin, if you wanna touch on this. I mean, we, we're sort of a work in process at this point, but um, but yeah, yeah, maybe you can share something around what you maybe what we do today and how you envision that evolving, you know, as uh, in the future. Sure, um, I actually was able to get to this question uh, with a reply in chat, but um, cool. basically we have uh, two separate Figma files, um, and the first one is basically a model of all the patterns and components that are available within the form flow builder uh, product. And then it uses our design system, which is a separate file. Um, and then we have a separate uh, file that is a replicate. It replicates the starter application that engineers can use to bootstrap um, form flow builder applications more qu quickly. So, um, yeah, that's basically uh, it in a nutshell. 
um, it's kind of a manual uh, process for keeping them one one to one. But um, yeah, we're thinking about ways that we can take advantage of some of Fig Figma's features to tie our, those two systems together. But um, TBD on what we actually end up doing. That's great. Um, we have a question here: uh, Is the Formflow Builder library, is the Formflow library, open source? Um, yes, it's open source, but right now it's internal to Code for America only. Um, we're in the middle of an extended beta at, at, at this time. We haven't re yet released our 1.0 version of, of the tool internally. Um, and once we do that, um, next year we'll be considering if we want to make it more widely available. But right now um, we're very active and uh, in terms of developing and bringing changes from the project teams back into the Formflow library um, and things like that. So we're working out a lot of the kinks in the process, but um, hopefully we'll be able to make it more generally available um, and support it uh, for a wider audience outside of uh, Code for America. Um, that, would be, that would be our goal, but we've got a lot of kinks to work out at the moment. If anybody else wants to speak to that, please, please feel free. Um, we have a question from Tiffany. Uh, maybe Alex, you might be able to take this one. Um, any tips to allow screen readers to better describe maps or alternatives for people who are blind? That's a great question. Oh boy. Um, to be fair, it's something that I have uh, very little experience with. And in my, my personal experience, it is really difficult to achieve well um, the few things that I do know, um, that are helpful are to make sure that all of your tabbable elements within the map, um, have alternative text or text descriptions, um, to make sure that, um, you have, uh, essentially, um, text alternatives uh, for map elements um, so that uh, rather than having to look at a map, um, somebody can look at a text description of the directions for getting somewhere. Um, and then outside of screen readers specifically, other things that I've seen that are helpful are making sure that um, the map is accessible at different levels of zoom uh, for people with um, low vision or visual impairments um making sure that um there's high contrast between elements on the map um for other visual impairments um, especially for folks um with uh different types of color blindness um but yeah maps in general are just really hard um but uh hopefully that's helpful yeah um we have another question here on why not use label instead of having the are you currently in school as a header um yeah, Alex, so you could speak to that for that particular example um we're using uh buttons for the yes or no um rather than um an input field and in that particular case um the choose to use described by is because of the way the screen reader will read ARIA labeled by versus ARIA described by um, for buttons. Um, there's just a particular nuance there. And in this case, ARIA described by will cause the screen reader um, to read the label, or sorry, read the header element in association with the button after the value, which we just thought was a bit more helpful for the context for that particular kind of screen. Yeah, and I think we we have time for one more question. So maybe um, maybe this this last one here. So, do you use any behavioral analytics to evaluate accessibility? Does anybody want to comment on that? I'm not sure exactly what's meant by the question. Um, I do know, at least in the past, we have used direct um, user experience research with uh, 
people that have varying types of disabilities um, to test the accessibility of our applications. And in that way, we've gotten good feedback um, behaviorally from folks who have different types of disabilities, ranging from um, individuals who are blind to individuals with low mobility um, to individuals with different types of colorblindness. I don't know if that answers the question. And I, I can uh, continue this answer. So we are pretty hesitant to uh, apply um, automatic tracking to our clients, um, particularly particularly mouse events, keyboard events, um, and things like that. Um, it's not to say that we wouldn't do it, but we wouldn't do it by default. Um, so we would m uh, rather rely on um, uh, uh, manual testing with, uh, with folks um, than automatically uh, tracking their, their input devices, or even I know there's some analytics uh, that uh, record folks screens as they use it uh, on the website. Um, that is something that we just um, avoid by default unless we have a really good reason why we would want to use something like that. Great. Um, I think that's good. So just thanks for your questions and thanks team for bringing all these different perspectives together um, to just give folks, hopefully we were able to give you a little bit of a flavor for how we're working through the various aspects of accessibility with our internal tooling. Um, and, you know, just give everybody a flavor for things like, uh, if you came in without say a coding or technical background, hopefully that was interesting for you to see how a screen reader actually works and how it knows, you know, what to do and, how you program that at a very simple kind of high level. So yeah, thanks for coming and um, see you in another session. So thanks y'all. Yeah, thank you. I just have a couple closing remarks. Um, one that was amazing, the accessibility work happening at Code for America is just phenomenal. My grandmother was actually um, type one diabetic. So she went blind in the eighties when I was young. And I remember at her bedside, she had this little box. And if you pressed a button, it would tell her the time. Um, and it's just remarkable to see how much work has been done. If she was here, she would be blown away by this. It's just really critical for people to access um, important government services that they need. So thanks so much. Um, just a reminder for our attendees today, we hope you enjoyed this session. We have a break right now before our closing keynote. You can take advantage of our networking opportunities during this break. If you navigate over to the networking space on the left side of your screen, um, you'll be randomly paired with an attendee for some speed networking. So fun way to spend your afternoon. Uh, and then we look forward to seeing you at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific for our closing session, which is on the future of forms. Thank you, everyone. See you soon.